So welcome to the first Fairbank Center Modern China Lecture of the Spring. Uh, my name is Arunab Ghosh. I teach modern Chinese history here in the history department. I'm also the convener of this lecture series. Uh, before I proceed with introducing our honored speaker today, I want to take a minute to share with you our uh, list of upcoming talks. Um, we have two more planned uh, over the course of the semester. The first, two weeks from now, on March 19th, uh, we will host uh, Chris Courtney from Durham University. Uh, Chris will deliver a talk titled Heat and the Urban Environment of Modern China. And then our final talk will feature Ulu Kuzuolu from Washington University in St. Louis. This will be on April 3rd. It's a Wednesday, unlike our usual Tuesday afternoon meetings. And Ulu will deliver a talk titled uh, Codes of Modernity, Chinese Scripts in the Global Information Age, based on his just published uh, book. Although not a part of this series, I believe the Fair Fairbank Center will also host talks by Steve McKinnon and Joseph Eschrich in April. Uh, so do keep an eye out uh, for uh, announcements about those two talks. Um, but anyway, uh, those announcements aside, today I'm really delighted and honored to welcome uh, to the Fairbank Center, Professor Fatih Fan. Uh, Fatih is Professor of History at Binghamton University, State University of New York, uh, and his research and teaching uh, have focused on, on several areas, three in particular, history of environmental sciences, 20th century China, and science and empire. Uh, he has also written on historiographical and methodological issues, as many of you are likely aware, um, uh, especially as they relate to global histories of science uh, and Asia as method. Uh, one of my favorites is an essay he wrote a long time ago called East Asian STS, Fox or Hedgehog, uh, which you, if you haven't read, it's a very short essay, but it's a terrific little piece, which I would highly recommend checking out. Uh, it came out in East Asian Science, Technology, and Society. Uh, Fatih is the author of the monograph, British Naturalists in Qing, China, uh, Science, Empire, and Cultural Encounter, <coughs> uh, published by Harvard University Press in 2004, uh, with a Chinese translation that came out in 2011, and then with a new edition and title in 2018. He's currently working on several new projects. I was just trying to get some clarity on this a moment ago, uh, <laughs> because I tried to reconstruct this from his website. So I'll tell you what I think is going on. <laughs> the, the, the first is a, a book manuscript that is completed uh, on um, earthquakes in communist China, uh, titled or tentatively titled, uh, The People's War Against Earthquakes, Science, Politics, and Natural Disasters in Communist China. And then, things get confusing, he has, I think, a second book on science and politics in Republican China, but he's also working on a book with Shellen Wu, who delivered a, a lecture here in the fall uh, last year, uh, titled Science in the Making of Modern China, and this is currently under contract with Cambridge University Press. Uh, Fatih is the author of numerous articles, indeed too many to even try to begin to list or summarize, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, he has also been involved uh, in uh, service to the field, and as many of you, again, likely know, he was most recently the um, president of the History of Science Society from 2022 to 2023, and as we were just talking, he was the first historian of East Asia or East Asian science mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to be the president, so it's quite a, quite a landmark um, uh, moment. Uh, his talk today uh, is titled, uh, it combines, I guess, some of these research interests we've heard. It is titled, uh, D well, it's up here, Disaster Governance and Socio-Political Participation in China from the Republican Period to the Present. So before I hand things off to him, just two words about format. Fatih will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, I think. Uh, we'll then follow that with a Q&A of about 30 minutes uh, with a targeted finish time of maybe 5.15, but we can certainly stretch that to 5.30 if... Uh, you know, uh, it, it, so, it so warrants. Uh, so, uh, Fatih, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here, uh, and over to you. Thank you so much for a kind and generous introduction. And uh, so as you can see, the title is somewhat different from what is on the poster. And so that's add to the confusion you were just <laughs> mentioned. But, but in any case, is that, uh, so my eyesight is very poor, so I cannot see the clock there. I, don't, I can't even see that. So I see just like white thin there. I don't see the hands. <laughs> so somebody stopped me uh, about 40 minutes, or somebody kind of a signal yeah, to me. Don't worry, don't worry. Oh, you can throw <laughs> tomatoes, <laughs> like, brrr, kind of thing. So, all right. So, uh, so anyway, so um, thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor and privilege here. So I see this uh, more as a conversation rather than uh, me giving a, a lecture as such. So basically, I'll basically give uh, probably 40 minutes and I uh, share with you some of these ideas and uh, uh, what I consider to be very uh, kind of salient points that we should uh, probably as scholars pay attention to. And then uh, the floor will be open and then we can just uh, discuss uh, basically these I issues as well as any other issues you think um, are important. So 
first of all, um, let's, uh, since it's about disasters, and so let's kind of lay the groundwork. So I kind of give a general kind of understanding as, you know, as my starting point, how do we think about disasters and so on. Importantly, uh, with this talk is the disaster governance and the management from, uh, with involved with, say, political entities. So the, and so there are several things that um, I want to highlight would be, say, when we say disaster governance and the management here, I want to uh, kind of point out that there are several uh, aspects to it. One is the disaster preparedness and the response. That would be uh, if disaster happened or just about to happen, then what is, what is the response? And recovery, if it happened, then after that, how do we think would be the best way to uh, recover from a disaster? And then would be uh, mitigations uh, of risk, hazards, and so on. So these things uh, will be covering. So that's one aspect. The second would be uh, disaster politics. These are all interrelated is in terms of uh, uh, what well, if there's a disaster happened uh, in both preparedness or response and then other things as well, like how do we the, how do we prepare for it? How do we basically mobilize people to get involved? And that's so he comes to the uh, participation part. And then that also involve uh, surveillance in itself is a political form as well as action and as well as so, and also uh, disaster governance uh, um, often is related to political legitimacy that if you do well in governing or controlling disasters, which means that you're uh, consolidating more political uh, positions, mm -hmm. vice versa, it could be uh, kind of risky uh, for political legitimacy if it happens uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question of a uh, uh, risk distribution. So it happens at the macro politics or micro politics, how this risk of hazards are distributed across different fault lines in society or, or political uh, uh, entities and so on and so forth. And then finally, uh, not, you know, these are just examples, say the shock doctrine in itself is also a political aspect of disaster politics, uh, uh, which would be, for example, like if a disaster happened, then uh, this kind of perspective could say that, oh, disaster happened, you wipe the slate clean, and then you can bring in new institutions, uh, either political, social institutions, economic institutions. So this happened both in capitalist societies as well as in uh, more kind of authoritarian uh, societies or uh, government as well. So that's uh, wh what you want to do. And then the idea is that, oh, maybe with a disaster, it's actually, mm, it's not all, all quote unquote bad in the case that it opened up new possibility for you to implement uh, political institutions as, and so on and so forth. And then there's these issues about uh, risk reduction and how do we do it? And then what would be the best approach to do it? Who should have, or who ended up uh, sharing greater um, responsibilities or who, sh who ended up sharing a greater possibility for risk and, uh, uh, and uh, hazards as well as uh, how do we um, make sure that to build a society that is resilient to disasters but without sacrificing uh, say environmental as well as disaster justice and so on. So these are things we'll be talking about. And uh, here is, first of all, we also want to have a sense of how do we define disaster uh, here in this particular context. So the traditionally they often think about disasters in terms of natural, natural disasters. And then obviously recently we, we have a lot more complex understanding of the situations like uh, what we sometimes call natural disasters are actually often quote unquote unnatural in the sense that human action was directly involved in, in the basically inseparable from what was happening uh, disaster-wise, right? So which also in this case that um, often happen is you kind of begin to draw boundaries between, for example, external, internal causes for disaster. Uh, so it's just a natural disaster means that human is a human society is a kind of internal and external is a external accident happened that you cannot control, right? So earthquake, for example, you could say, oh, earthquake happened, we had no control, or I don't know, like a meteorite coming, boom, right? We had no control, and that's a natural disaster. But on the other hand, though, one could easily see that earthquake happened in theory outside our control. But on the other hand, though, the impact of earthquakes were distributed social across different social uh, lines that different social groups suffer differently. And that's, that's internal into uh, human society. So here's uh, kind of lines become a lot uh, less clearly drawn in this case, right? So, so we have to keep in an eye on thinking about disaster in this way, right? So that is, uh, we don't want to uh, simply externalize uh, 
causes of uh, natural, dis natural disasters. And then we'll see this is a highly political issue, and then we'll come back to talk about this issue. As well as sudden or long term, right? So say, oh, the disaster happens suddenly, and it's external, and it's basically abnormal phenomenon, or disasters, as well as all sorts of other hazards that happened, was actually could be a long accumulative process that, um, like, I don't know, frog in boiling water kind of situation. Then all of a sudden, boom, like the accident happened. So is it really part of a long process or is it just a sudden ex external accident, right? So these are issues that are highly politicized in many different ways. And then do we think about this as, as abnormal, like something happened outside of a norm or it is actually often pretty regular or to be expected. This comes to uh, Charles Perrault's idea, no more accidents, right? Or modern risk, risk societies, that like risks are with us. It's not you cannot eliminate the risks because they are with us. Or normal accidents, accidents are kind of a part of a normality of a uh, modern society, right? So all these concepts that we have to keep in mind when we think about uh, the case we'll be talking about. So here, thinking about risk, hazards, and here it comes with disaster is worst case scenario. So if we think that uh, accidents are normal in a sense, normal accidents, and the risks are modern risk society, they're always with us, then think about risks and hazards and also the worst case scenario when it happens, all these risks and the hazards converge and they happen and that would be a disaster or catastrophe. Now, <coughs> so if we think about this kind of framework and I begin to think about, um, say, an example, say a, a pandemic happened, right? So then, then we don't think about the pandemic simply as a matter of public health, but rather is one kind of a disasters and the disaster governance and the management <coughs> issues. So, and in this case, it would be a kind of a history, uh, as historians would think about, history of a disaster governance response and the management to uh, the pandemic, and certain features, I think, are specific to modern China and the data we'll see, but others were actually shared by many modern states. So comparatively speaking, that is not peculiar. In some ways, it was peculiar to, um, say, uh, contemporary China in some ways, how the pandemic was handled. But on the other hand, though, there were many things that are shared also by other modern states as well. And I won't be able to go into a lot of comparative uh, kind of examples, but this is something that um, you know, I would invite you to think about uh, after the talk. So my interest is not evaluative. Like I said, I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's good, it's bad, and so on and so forth. That's, that's inevitably what we'll have to think about it uh, going forward. But on the other hand, so here in this talk, I want to really uh, kind of ask us to think about more historically, analytically, and uh, as kind of a comparatively and which I would like to invite you because you will have a, a lot more knowledge than I do in terms of how to think about this uh, comparatively. So, but first of all, let's go back to um, the past. So we take kind of a special back to the future vehicle, back to the past. Uh, think about the old days uh, in China, this is the Han Dynasty, and a lot of these ideas of a form uh, before Han Dynasty but consolidated during the Han Dynasty is this. That is, disaster in traditional Chinese moral political cosmology. So these things about this, right? So basically it's a, it says that, for example, uh, if you go against heaven, heaven and earth, that is the, cosmo, uh, the order, cosmological order, and you go against human ways, the human way, then uh, the heaven will inflict disaster on you, right? So, and then if you depart from the way, then disaster will follow and so on and so forth, right? So, and then here it comes to political issues, right? Political legitimacy, that is, uh, at the end of, uh, usually at the end of a certain reign, right, political reign, usually you will see disasters, right? So here is the line between natural and uh, human is simply not clear here because it's, it's, it's very common, here's a moral, um, so, so moral cosmology in this case is that your behavior directly is related to uh, disasters and the, what is called natural realm and so on, heaven, right, and so on and so forth. So the line between na nature and human reigns are blurred in this case. And we'll keep this in mind the coming forward, right? 
And then here is examples of how these things work with regard to the last one. At the end of a particular reign or dynasty, then there will be a kind of disasters happening, right? So here it is. This is from uh, the, the Romance of Three Kingdoms. And this is like, da 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 then uh, so the gust of wind uh, came out, and then you see a big uh, blue snake uh, kind of flew from the beam of the palace and the camera, and then they curl around the chair or a throne where the uh, emperor was supposed to sit in, and then you have uh, thunderstorms, huge rains, and uh, hailstorms, and then houses are being destroyed, and then there are earthquakes, there you go. That's perfect background music. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's wonderful. That's right. That's precisely perfect for this. Okay, that's right. That's right. And then you have a tsunami or like a storm surge and so on and so forth. Disasters happening. More tragic music. But anyway, so, right. so this is what happened, right? So this is in the. So this is what is describing. At the end of a rain, these disasters will come out. And so in this case, uh, the disasters meant that the cosmological order was out of whack, such as these things. It's like, so this is not simply a disaster, but the E. E means it's abnormal, right? It's, it's, it's unusual kind of phenomenon, aberration, right? So and so on and so forth. So, but this worldview also assigned a great deal of responsibility to government, the way it's governing and then the head of the state. That's why traditionally the emperors and so on have the responsibility of a ji tian, right? So such as um, to pray the rain, for instance, the long drought, uh, yu si. Uh, say, for example, the Ming Dynasty, uh, Ming Shenzhong, for example, uh, was have a huge kind of a pray uh, rituals and the ceremonies. And then the emperor, in a sense, actually are responsible, right? So that's a political responsibility. That particular legitimacy become very significant in this process, right? So if 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 there are disasters, then you have to be careful because that means that maybe you need to cultivate your virtues and so on and so forth. So, in terms of more concrete level, now how when disaster happened, or if you're preparing with disaster, how do they actually do? And it's a remarkable uh, continuity, so to speak, from all the way from the Zhou Dynasty to the Qin Dynasty, right? So here is like so, and they say there are twelve principles or twelve policy matters that you should consider. They are not exactly the same in the Zhou and the uh, Qin era, but they are uh, surprisingly similar in many ways, right? So, and I don't want to go to, I don't need to go into the details, but for more important for us is actually the Qin because it will continue to the uh, Republican era. So they said there are 12 policies. One is uh, to prepare, be prepared. So be prepared for uh, disasters. And the second is that you should eliminate the hazard, right? So you eliminate the hazards. And then you should uh, come to rescue when there's uh, famine happened and the bad times happen, you should come to rescue, like you should do something. The government should do something. That includes, for example, uh, to uh, have an immediate assistance, uh, cash and so on and so forth, right? And then you reduce the taxations as well as uh, whatever you, you uh, how much how much rice you should ask people to give you uh, to to yield to the government and so on and so forth. And they should give loans and they should uh, reduce people's uh, kind of uh, work. And then you should uh, you know build certain kind of uh, infrastructure better. And then you should take it, take care of the refugees. And these are the policies uh, from the Qin. Uh, so the Qing government to say these are our responsibility to uh, when there's a disaster, the disaster governance policies. And this is basically, um, if you look at these, one thing you notice, sorry, let me drink some water, but one thing you would notice is these two 12 things, it's pretty narrowly defined. So really mostly about disaster response. That is, does that happen? How do you respond to the disaster? And before that, the only thing uh, is the first one is to be prepared. You say you have to be prepared. For example, you should, um, you know, have uh, grain, uh, granaries should be, uh, you know, enough grains there, enough uh, food there, and so on and so forth. Be prepared, basically. Uh, very few is talking about directly involved, say, risk reduction, hazard management, and so on and so forth. 
On the other hand, though, it seems to make some sense because if you're in the moral political cosmology, like your actions actually had to do with disasters, right? It means government or leaders, political leadership's actions. Right? So in a sense, like in theory, if you're doing well, I mean, if you're a good ruler, then disaster should not happen. So that's the preparedness. It's not so much that you prepare for a disaster as a natural phenomenon that will happen, but rather, if you want to prevent, so it's prevention, prevent disaster from happening, you have to be a good ruler, right? So it's a cultivation, virtues, and so on and so forth. And so that's a very different way of seeing it. So in a sense that you see, oh, this is actually narrowly defined. But in that particular cosmology, it's actually not narrowly defined because the other, way, the other kind of a different side of a story is that you are supposed to be a good ruler and you will prevent disaster from uh, happening. So this kind of a basic uh, uh, concept of cosmology continued to the Republican period with the breakdown of this moral political cosmology but not with the general policy. So in the Republican period, a lot of the general policy in terms of disaster governance still follow this very similar kind of a situation um, with certain kind of uh, additions. So they still have the government should be responsible for a lot of the things, ideally, in theory, okay? So it means the central government, the provincial government, and the local government, they all have to play a role. On the other hand, though, just like in the old days, um, the Qin Dynasty and before, the local gentry had played a very important role, both in the Qin Dynasty and in the Republican period. So they were the ones often, like they said, spontaneously, or encouraged by the government, they were the ones who come forward and uh, provide uh, support to the local people, and so on and so forth, right? To give out food, water, and all these other things, and they give money, and so on and so forth. And then in that late Qin, as well as in uh, Republican period, a lot of international organizations also get involved, including Red Cross, including missionary societies, and uh, so on and so forth. This is that during the Republican period, a lot of things was going on there, but with a very limited success, or <laughs> depends on how to say success, but with um, a lot of challenges. In part because there were a lot of disasters during that time, Lei Qin and uh, then Republican period. Um, so modern scholars sometimes to, I mean, depends on how you define disasters, but they would say there are about 77, according to um, Chinese scholars, there are about 77 major disasters during the Republican period, right? And then obviously Lei Qin, there were many, many um, two. So it's, it's instead of a dividing simply by the political dynasties, we can see there's a whole series of ecological environmental disasters going on through that period. There are many reasons for that, um, say, uh, so much so that uh, say Westerners say, wow, this is a land of famine, basically, in the Qin and the uh, European period. And so why were there so many disasters? There were many, many reasons, um, for example, right? So these are disasters are often it's like natural, unnatural, right? So this is kind of a human actions or natural disaster kind of blur together. So one is ecological degradation because of population pressures, like a lot of the scholars have talked about this since the Qin period, that the population become very large for the particular uh, kind of ecological um, environmental uh, sustainability in China during that time. And that certainly put a lot of pressure on many, many situations such as the Yangtze River continuously, regularly flooded, and that had to do with uh, ecological uh, environmental degradations and so on and so forth. And a lot of time, obviously, there was a lot of failed uh, governments in the states. The government states itself were really un highly unstable, and they had very limited ability to do disaster governance when itself was actually very unstable. And then, um, since the late Qin, obviously, the China experienced a lot of economical, uh, economic difficulties. So there's economic struggles, both in the state uh, level, at the government level, uh, had a fiscal crisis, as well as the local uh, in general, right? Uh, provincial and the, and the people, society in general. And then there is, uh, with that, there's also a lot of a, a kind of a tensions among different uh, regional 
societies as well as the society within itself that creates a more difficulty in terms of disaster governance and the man management if you have tensions within society. And then obviously throughout the time period, there were wars, um, both civil wars, but also uh, wars with uh, other uh, external powers and so on. Now, all these challenges, problems of a Republican uh, governments together produce poor disaster governance. That is very hard for them when they ch face so many challenges to be able to effectively and efficiently to govern uh, during the disaster times or to combat the disasters or to manage the disasters, I should say. So for example, one of the famous one, which uh, Chris Corney, which uh, he studied is uh, this uh, Young's uh, Hawaii flood, which was uh, tremendous flood and that caused uh, millions of people was being displaced. And uh, you know, the figures people were disputed, uh, like how many people actually drown or die. And in the process, a lot of were, uh, it's hard to count because if you, you know, a lot of people didn't drown, but they can uh, uh, die of uh, starvation, malnutrition, but also uh, diseases uh, like cascading disasters. Like, you know, first you have flood, then you have food shortages, then you have uh, epidemics and all these things, right? It's, so it becomes difficult to count actually how many people actually die of the flood. But, you know, different stages is cause huge disasters, right? As you can see, it's a help. So you can see this is a kind of a cry for help uh, during that time. So, on the other hand, here's a comparative. Let's step back and then think about this issue. Right, this is certainly terrible, right, miserable. And the Republican government certainly faced a lot of challenges. However, disaster can happen uh, in situations here at US, US which is a kind of a um, kind of far out example, but on the other hand, so, uh, it's, we can think about it because uh, everybody just went through the pandemic, so we can think about this issue, right? So even without major external challenges compared to Republican government. The US has often actually performed quite poorly in terms of uh, disaster management and governance, right? So we, examples are many, so we can think of the, uh, all these examples up here. So there were, uh, so here I'm kind of uh, trying to figure out, right? So there were obviously before, basically, the US government structures was very different in the sense that disasters are supposed to be traditionally, historically, uh, throughout the 19th century, as well as early 20th century, was supposed to be the, gov uh, the respons responsibility of a state government, of this, as well as the local government, right? So mostly a state government. And so that's different from, say, a different concept from China. Right? So, so mostly it's a local responsibility or state responsibilities. And, and charity organizations. So that's supposed to be the main thing. So the federal government actually also intervene when it's needed. So the Congress will vote on these issues, but it's ad hoc. There's no kind of an institutionalized governance uh, principles until later. Right? So throughout the 19th century, for example, there were about 100 different cases that the Congress was kind of have a vote, and they say, yes, we should uh, provide help to this particular disaster uh, ravaged area, and so on and so forth, right? So it's ad hoc process. Um, not until basically Federal Emergency Act in the uh, between the New Deal era, as well as the FEMA and so on, the federal government began to be able to say declare federal emergency, and then the uh, federal government can direct be involved compared to say mo normally the state responsibility. But that didn't really s solve the problem in the sense that because of many other political issues involved, such as uh, for example, uh, the U.S. there is a long tradition of a state want to claim its rights, state rights. So then federal government say, okay, so we want to help, the state may not necessarily want to accept it for various reasons, especially during the say, civil rights movement of the era. If a southern state uh, got hit by a hurricane, so the, the federal government say, I want to help you. But then the local government of the state, say Louisiana, and sometimes they say, hmm, I'm not so sure, because the idea is that if you get involved, then the federal government influenced the local politics, right? And especially racial politics in this case that they were concerned about. Mm -hmm. So this is a certain kind of conflicts or tensions in the US system that has never been resolved entirely. That's why I think it's very hard sometimes for, for me as somebody who actually as a, a, a 
foreigner came to this country to see how these things work, it didn't seem to work all that well sometimes in this case, right? So not to mention, this is only the structure of a disaster management at the federal as well state level, but also a lot of uh, social tensions, uh, fault lines, and so on in this country often cause these issues. So therefore, you see this, you say, oh yeah, this China has a lot of work to do, but on the other hand though, the 27 Mississippi floods, it has a lot of problems, in the, it's a l very large floods, uh, kind of a similar uh, in terms of uh, impact to the U.S. compared to the Young's flood uh, in China and the so on and so forth, right? you can see similar kind of situation. There were a lot of social strifes going on, tensions, as well as the dif dif difficulty in terms of the federal level and the state level, and not to mention more recently, Katrina, right? So you can see the kind of situations. It was miserable when I was, I was already here in this country when Katrina happened, and if you look at it, it was like, at least for me, I, I, um, so I felt like, how could this actually happen in the U.S., right? So you kind of say, it's like on TV, and it's just like, it's almost hard for me to connect as a foreigner coming to, how could this be possible? Like this is like a, 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 a wealthy country to have let this happen this way for days, right? It's just like such a shocking thing to me anyway. So, and you can see this kind of situation and help. Right, so, and you see, uh, is it a help? And you're helping, you're asking for help too, right? So here's come to disaster governance, right? It's not so simple, right? The Republic of China has its tradition, it faces a lot of challenges, but a different model might have its own problems too. So I guess uh, somebody has to take responsibility. Anyway, so. Now, we're moving forward to, um, the People's Republic of China. So here's a question. Is the one is important thing is about disaster governance play a role in political legitimacy. That is that, so the PRC government legitimized itself uh, for many different reasons. One of them was disaster governance. We are better at managing disasters, which happened in so many times in the Republic of China, right? So, the, so in so doing, it means that they contrast old and the new China. Old China was like this that they cannot handle this kind of situation, but we can, right? So we have to do better, in a sense. So it's not an expectation, but it's also a pronouncement, right? So we can do better, and we, we will be able to do better. And then, so then the first major disaster was uh, 1954, the Yangtze flood that happened uh, basically in uh, Hubei and, and uh, other provinces down there, and Hunan, and so on, you can so. But before that disaster happened, this is precisely they want to prevent it from happening, is to build this uh, Changjiang, this uh, Jinjiang Divergent Project for flood control, as well as uh, irrigation and so on, but for mainly for flood control. Right? As you can see, that they mobilize everybody to participate, trying to build these divergent uh, channels and uh, so on and so forth. And they involve many, many if local people here and so on and so forth, but also involve uh, engineers, uh, Chinese engineers, uh, Soviet advisors, and so on so forth to build this kind of a project uh, so that they can uh, manage the Yangtze flood. So hopefully Yangtze, Yangtze, uh, Yangtze, the Yangtze River won't flood so badly after that. So the project, the uh, flood control project, highlights the flood control infrastructure, right? So to build this new uh, divergent uh, kind of a project there, it reflects good governance, right? So it is a long-running thing in Chinese tradition. Right? It's all the way back to Du Zhang Yan, right? Du Zhang Yan is like you, a good government, a good governance will be able to build. This is like, you know, all the way back to the Zhang era and so on and so forth, right? So that you build this um, flood control, it means that you're a uh, good government, right? You, you, you reduce these uh, hazards and so on and so forth. So it's a long historical tradition and then uh, PRC utilize this tradition or follow this tradition. And so, so, uh, also in the process, because it's such a mobilization project, you also consolidate uh, your state control. At that time, remember in 1954, it was still very young regime, right? So in the process, it's also uh, the state would be able to better connect with the society and so on and so forth. And then it is also hydraulic modernity. That is, uh, this is hydraulic project, but it's also a modern project. Right, so this is a modern China, new China with this modern technology and so on and so forth. 
So the Jinjiang project and was precisely to project these kind of disaster management uh, kind of ideas. So none of these concerns, on the other hand, none of these concerns were particular to the PRC, right? In terms of a flock control means good governance, and in terms of a consolidated state control, in terms of resource uh, management, in terms of a hydraulic modernity, and all these things were quite popular in mid 20th century China. I mean, in mid 20th century uh, globally, uh, in many developing uh, worlds, right? And so on. So, however, the emphasis, though, in the China is uh, quite clear. That, for example, in this poster, you can see that it's precisely the contrast now than before, right? So there's a 31 flood and then there's a 54 flood, right? So now with this new hydraulic modernity, now you can see the little fish talking to the mommy fish, say, mommy, mommy, say, you say that, you know, when there's a water, a lot of water means a flood, right? We, we, we can go visit uh, the theme park, amusement park, right? So it means that the water is flooded in the amusement park and the fish can go there, right? So, so and the mommy say, no, 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 time is different. This is no longer 1931. So we cannot go to the amusement park anymore, right? So it means that the f however big, bad the fly is, it cannot go over uh, to the amusement park and so on. So it's this contrast of the past and the new China in terms of we cannot control the flood. So this is the kind of thing that is uh, often uh, in a PRC. So, so the political legitimacy in part depends on how you contrast with the old China, right? The Republican China and so on. So this is uh, the movement in the 1960s about Yi Ku Si Tian and the pre precisely to say, oh, we remember the past bitterness, right? So that was very bitter in the past. Now it's, it's better now, right? So this kind of a contrast. So it's very similar to this kind of a rhetoric as well as uh, the basically underlying political legitimacy and so on. So now, so what was a very important part of a um, disaster governance for PRC then. So again, it also has central government, provincial government, and local government. And the local communities are also directly involved, right? However, there is also a very important uh, doctrine or principle is zhiu, which is very common in, uh, as you can see, coming along again and again in whenever there's a disaster. It means a self-sufficiency, self-reliance at the local level. So the local communities should be able to, um, even though it was hit by the disaster, and they're very bad, you're supposed to be able to uh, you know, come up on your own in the sense that to produce uh, through production, you will be able to stand up again, and so on. So it's, a, it's, it's not simply top down, right? So the emphasis on the local communities should be able to do that. And so where is it from, though, this kind of a principle? Um, so it is from the self-sufficient and self-help uh, kind of a movement through production in the Yanan era, right? So here's the slogan. The Yanan era obviously is highly deprived, so there are very few things, the resources and so on and so forth. You should maximize it. So one way to maximize it is instead of a, uh, you know, depending on a central party uh, government is to encourage everybody to produce, right? To support yourselves and so on and so forth. So here is uh, a, a basic slogan is very uh, caring is that you with one hole and one gun, right? So it's a self-defense, but also self-production movement. Mm -hmm. We will help ourselves through production and defend the party central committee. Mm -hmm. So there's a party central committee. So it's, it's like everybody should participate in it and uh, defend so it's a military uh, metaphor here, or not, not metaphor, actually organization here, but also pr production, right? So it's, a, it's, it's, it's about military, but it's also about production, right? So here's uh, from the Yan period, you can see, it's a, these are kind of a, uh, pictures taken from that time. So people working to produce food for themselves, but also uh, to, to to make sure that uh, you will be sufficiency uh, among ourselves and so on. So, and this is kind of tradition continued, right? So continued, and you can see here, 
right, in the 1960s, it's like, it's, oh, let's prepare for war, because it's like in the 1960s, we were really worried about actually war could be real. So prepare for war, prepare for famine. This is uh, from uh, Mao's uh, instruction. And for the people, right? So it's in a sense that it's very similar. It's a hole on one hand, a gun on the other, and uh, through self-production, so, and we can become a self-reliant uh, community, and so on and so forth, right? And so here's continue, and you can see there's a gun, but there is a food, so we're preparing for war, but we are also preparing for famine. We are also basically fighting for the people. Okay, so, so this kind of emphasis on self-reliance might appear superficially, very superficially, similar to the example of the US we just talked about. So that is, it's also emphasized on, not on the central government to provide support, it's on the states as well as local government, and then local communities, right? So, and also um, civil organizations such as charities and so on and so forth, right? So it's a self-alliance at the state as well as local level, it's also at the co uh, community level, not the government involved directly, the federal government. So, However, basically, the ideological and the political underpinnings, despite the superficial difference of self-reliance, were very different. So in this case, it's not about state rights and all the other things, but it's basically not about state rights or the US myth of individualism or uh, bootstrapism and so on and so forth, right? pull yourself up kind of an American myth. Mm -hmm. um, but rather, it is a very pragmatic, right? So self-reliance, because there's not too much to offer you. So you have to depend on yourself. A bottom up and the campaign driven is pushing campaign, right? Campaign to energize the people and state building process, right? So there's a state, state building process rather than simply a di structurally distributed uh, situation as in the US that is about power balance. It is not about balance of the powers of a state and the federal government. It's really about these lower organizations should be able to support themselves and then move in toward a shared goal, that is to build the state. And this uh, kind of uh, ideas as well as rhetoric still existed today. This is basically uh, very recent, the last year, and you can see that it still have the idea of a Xin and in, in today, right? So it's always recycled uh, in public media today. So here it comes back to remind you about natural and unnatural disasters, right? So traditional Chinese cosmology, that is, there's no clear line between natural and unnatural disasters. And we talked about often if you want to assign natural disaster, it's often you externalize the causes, not in some of the human actions. It's that these are just an external accident that happened, right? So it's an abnormal phenomenon. It's not part of our normal process and so on and so forth of our society. So that is the natural disaster, right? You try to externalize it to call it a natural disaster it means human responsibility are much less so, and so on and so forth. And this was also utilized, right? So because of the breakdown of the traditional cosmology and continue, and so here's a very a strong desire to kind of put this into natural category in terms of disasters, such as this, right? So, and the three years of natural disasters, so why is it called a natural disaster? It's because the natural, you want to call it a natural disaster. So you have the importance to call it a natural disaster, precisely to be able to externalize these causes. Right? So in a sense that, so it's, it's called uh, the three years of a natural disasters. As you can see, natural, unnatural, it's a highly political issue. So what about earthquakes? So during the Cultural Revolution, there was a whole series of earthquakes, about 10 major earthquakes. These are seven or above, uh, speculative seven or above. These are major earthquakes. And obviously they culminated uh, with the Tangshan earthquake, which uh, uh, a quarter of a million people died, and they just wiped out overnight, uh, a major industrial uh, kind of a city. But it's a whole series of the, uh, natural disasters that happened during the time of the Cultural Revolution. So on the one hand, you have a social turmoil, uh, political upheavals, uh, uncertainties, and then on the other hand, you have natural disasters are constantly kind of uh, making people uh, very stressful and jitterish and so on and so forth in the meantime. All these things happen at the same time. 
So the emphasis during that time, though, if you read um, any reports during that time, uh, science literature, popularization, uh, science literature about earthquakes and so on and so forth, they all emphasize that earthquakes are natural phenomena. So basically to distance this, to basically to avoid for people to think about these um, kind of a disasters, so related to political legitimacy. Uh, we have to remember this is during Cultural Revolution. It's very confusing at this time. And then, so they, so they said uh, earthquakes are zilanxianxiang, natural phenomena, and then they would try to explain earthquakes this is because of this, because of that, and so on and so forth, right, to protect political legitimacy. And with that, though, there's also emphasis on, actually, you know what? Since it's a natural phenomena, we can study earthquakes, and then if we can study earthquakes, just like many other natural phenomena, they kind of surmise, but maybe we can kind of predict earthquakes. And that's what happened. Then they began to think that, oh, it's, it is possible to maybe to kind of uh, monitor as well as predict earthquakes. So here is the people's war against earthquakes, right? So to defend ourselves against earthquakes, the most important thing is basically uh, prevention. Prevention here is inc including many different methods. Uh, you can obviously fortify your buildings and it doesn't sound so much, but that's really challenging to do. So the easier way, in a sense, the more practical way in their view, uh, it's which turned out to be not the case, but on the other hand though, if you believe in these things uh, at that time as they did, that they, they say, oh, which can really organize ourselves, monitor earthquake uh, phenomena or earthquake actions, and then seismic activities, and then we can really collectively defend ourselves against earthquakes. So here comes to the importance of monitoring and surveillance. We survey the earthquakes, monitor earthquakes collectively, right? The people, everybody, everybody. That's why the people's war, right? Everybody was involved. Everybody look out for uh, abnormal signs or aberrations and so on and so forth, right? This kind of a unusual natural phenomena to predict earthquakes. And this is monitoring and surveillance in the sense that you are not only monitoring natural phenomena trying to predict earthquakes. You are also, remember this is during uh, concerns, highly concerned about the cultural evolution of our wars uh, and so on and so forth, right? So it also means that you are surveillance there. So here you're monitoring earthquakes. You see abnormal phenomena in the call, right? And so it means that you constantly, you should be aware of your surroundings, your natural phenomena, right? Animals behave differently. There's strange phenomena. The clouds look different. The temperature feel not right. The, when you drink water, you look at the, your well water, looks turbid or whatever, so as we call, right? So report and surveillance. So, so you survey your natural phenomena, but you also survey yourselves, right? <laughs> the people. Right, so it means that the outside people coming in, also inside, there are people who are hidden. Just like there are earthquakes, the hidden seismic activities, right? You want to spot the, the signs of earthquake activities. You want to spot the signs of class enemies. Hidden, but subversive, right? Hidden, could destroy us. So it's a, this kind of a approach, it's a people's war approach to disaster governance. But war, was not limited to China, right? People's War, um, this approach was to see disasters as enemies, to fight, to defend ourselves against them. But on the other hand, so war metaphor was common, not only in China, but also in other states and societies when they actually talked about uh, disasters, including this pandemic, right? You can see like they're fighting a war, trench warfare, and they're fighting a war, right? And so on and so forth, right? This is from uh, Iwo Jima, this icon, mm -hmm. icon of Iwo Jima, but then you say these anti vexers are pulling back, and so on and so forth, right? But you can see Iwo Jima obviously is a war metaphor, and then you see trench warfare is a metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's war metaphors were common in, the, in other societies too. They use war as a metaphor for p fighting uh, disasters, in this case, uh, pandemics. But people's war is not simply a metaphor, though. Uh, it's a long run institution, right? So we're fighting a people's war against the pandemic, the COVID uh, pandemic, right? 
So here he is. Uh, this is from uh, uh, the president of China, right? See, she, and then basically it say this is a wall. And so this is more than a metaphor. Okay, so this is a wall. And so I, uh, from the beginning, I already said we are just about to fight a war, right? This is a people's war. And so it's a people's war, and the people will win, right? So and so on and so forth. We, we will win. And so on and so forth. And then we have to be resolute in fighting the war as a defense war. We have to defend Hubei and the Wuhan against the pandemic, like COVID pandemic, and so on and so forth. So this is actually a war. It's not, it's not simply a metaphor now. People's war is not a simply a metaphor, right? So and then continue, and this is from um, this time about the pandemic. So people's war is really uh, our best uh, treasure. We cannot throw it away. And there are new things we have to learn and the new features because now it's a new kind of people's war. And so ultimately, it's about total war. People's war is about total war, right? And this total war is about war of prevention, about defense, about control, right? So it's a zhongti zan, it's a total war. That means zan is a people's war. Zhuji zan means that we should block and the strike before the pandemic spreads, and so on and so forth, right? So all these things requires everybody to participate because of people's war. And this is also has a long tradition uh, in terms of a disaster governance in general, in terms of a sentai zijiu, but also in terms of a public health campaigns. So it's more than public health campaigns, that's why I don't want to limit this thing to only public health issues, it's not, because there's a much broader tradition of a, how to manage disasters, or how to respond to disasters, right? But on the other hand though, there's an immediate tradition about public health, right? So it's about germ warfare, right, germ warfare, against U.S. imperialism, right, the Korean War germ warfare, and the extent of uh, vaccine campaigns that is precisely in response to uh, American germ warfare against uh, North Korea and China, and so on and so forth, right? So this is a, this is a people's war is directly related to public health issue. Not only that uh, about this germ warfare, but also in the 1950s, obviously, Sigistosomiasis uh, campaigns, you can see that this is people's war. Everybody's involved trying to fight the epidemic of uh, Sigistosomiasis. And this is how people involved. Right, this is about this. So everybody was mobilized to find those snails that the uh, parasites are in these snails, right? So you just pick up those snails. And you mass movement, right? So everybody's involved and everybody do it. You're part of the people's war against the psychosomiasis. And so here it is, it become people's war. And so it's very prevalent in all these newspapers and so on so forth during that time, during the COVID pandemic, which is actually very different. It's interestingly, it's much less so in the 2003 SARS pandemic. If you compare news headlines at that time, to the pan COVID pandemic, there was a lot more people's wars um, ideas this time than the previous time, right? So it's drawn on a long tradition, but on the other hand, this is tr it's also amplified a, a, a long tradition in this case. And in this case, you can see the banner here is, right? So it's a don't panic, right? So we should get ready and we should trust science and do not spread rumor about uh, the pandemic. And then, so here is that, so each local community now is part of parcel of the larger uh, world structure. And then you have to uh, basically uh, do this uh, very control and the surveillance monitoring and so on and so forth. All these things happen uh, during the COVID pandemic under the basically umbrella of a people's war. And so here it is, now let's reflect upon it. It is a military model. Is it useful, perhaps, that I, I think that it's, it's actually, it could be effective in terms of uh, urgency. Now, it's, it's there, right? It's happened, let's fight, and so on. It's urgency, it's about defense and offense. It's about winning and losing. If you lose, you'll get wiped out. So you have to win, right? 
And this can be effective in terms of a very speedy mobilization to consolidate people's uh, kind of a uh, will and a goal and emphasize on broad participation. All of them actually happened in the first phase or early phase of a COVID pandemic. It's, it's highly controlled, but it's also energized a lot of people, mobilized a lot of people to do it, and so on and so forth, right? And the emphasis on command, control, discipline, and the sacrifice. Right, so command, clear command, clear control. Particular disciplines required, and the idea is that you must sacrifice certain things in life, you know, to achieve a winning, uh, kind of a, to win a war, right? And it's also by externalizing hazards, right? So these are the how it works by externalizing hazards. And these are enemies. They are enemies. That's why we fight, right? War against them. And then, in terms of calling something enemies, means that you're creating boundaries, right? So it's boundaries between nature and society. These are things are things we should wipe out, right? So it's nature uh, kind of thing. And then, right, we should defend ourselves against them, and so on and so forth. So this is the model of a, a people's war. Now, there are perhaps limitations, right? There are certain challenges. That is, the communities, even though it's about communities, people, but on the other hand though, they tend to be reduced to prescribed and the supportive roles, right? It's, it's, it's there, what you should do, and so on and so forth, right? You should do, you should participate, but this is your role in the positive. And it's not so much designed for slow disaster. So if, say like SARS uh, 2003, it ha it's over quickly, it can be very effective, I think. And but for a lingering disaster, such as COVID, for three years, it becomes very hard to sustain. Some wars you can, um, right? So some other, other wars is hard to sustain long attrition war. So it's a war of attrition, it becomes very, very difficult. Not to mention all the other uh, kind of uh, uh, situations. And it also kind of neglected long-term resilience or coexistence. So if we previously we're talking about a risk society, risk society is and no more accidents. These things are, you cannot simply see them as externalized, kind of a sudden uh, impactful things that you try to get rid of, you try to uh, you know, eliminate, because they are with you. It's how the society is. Then how do you externalize, externalize these things without actually also hurting yourself? It becomes very, very difficult. So it also, because it is so emphasis on fighting a war that it's a lot less to say about disaster risk reduction, mitigation, and prevention in terms of long term. So therefore, these things goals are become very narrowly defined. It's just ab all about disaster response. How do we actually do this? Rather than a larger, broader, long term thing, how do we actually reduce the risk of have say another zoonotic, zoonotic uh, uh, pandemic and so on and so forth? Right? That takes a very different kind of approach to environmental ecological issues, how society works, and so on and so forth. But the war metaphor doesn't help us to think these things clearly. And that's, I think, the problem. And it also have issue of a disaster justice. Like it's, so who is sacrificed for whom and what? You emphasize the sacrifice, a part of a war. You want to win the war, you have to sacrifice. Either your whatever liberty or whatever, and so on and so forth. But then what are you sacrificing for? Who is you know, sacrificing and so on and so forth. These are not clearly laid out in, in this kind of situation. On the other hand though, so here's what I would say. Basically disaster management is deeply indebted in social political institutions, ideas, beliefs, and the ethics, right? So I have to think about these issues in this particular case. So it can be effective in certain ways, but it may not be effective. But what is effectiveness? How do you measure effective? That is in itself intertwined with experiences, values, and memories, right? So that's why, I say, in the U.S., there's so much controversy about if you should wear a mask or not, and all these other things, because that has to do with values. It's not, it's not simply about how effective you can prevent germs from spreading. It's really about, to one extent, you also have to 
think about other values and so on and so forth, right? And, become, and this it had to do with memories, had to do with uh, experiences, it had to do with ideas, had to do with whatever ideologies and so on and so forth, right? So how do you measure effectiveness is not a simple thing. And that had to do with uh, kind of a directly involved in disaster management. So the people's war, the man, people's war can be effective in some ways, but may not be so effective in other ways. Vice versa, the US model probably not effective in many ways, most of ways, <laughs> but anyway, so, but that's also the question, right? So that is the situation. So ultimately the US would say 1.2 million people died. So it was certainly probably the highest among um, in industrial advanced countries, right? So, but on the other hand though, if you talk to people, some of them would say, you know what? It probably was worth it. But then that comes back to the issue of uh, what are the values being involved in the process, right? And on the other hand, though, probably not good values in my view, but maybe that's just me. All right, so that's just the talk, so, okay. Great, thank you so much. This is amazingly rich. You've covered so much, so much ground, both uh, in, in history, but also sort of conceptually. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but we have a great audience here, so I'm going to throw it open. Uh, and uh, so if anyone wants to ask a question, just please identify yourself, and then uh, we will take things from there. Yes. Thank you so much for this amazing and very rich talk. And I'm Solon. I'm a PhD student in the Institute of Science program at Harvard, and I work on the environmental history of the Primar in China. And I was really fascinated by the, the, the way you talk about the, there is something very unnatural about the natural disaster, right? It's the, especially in the Chinese tradition, the very boundary between the human world and the natural world could be really blurred and really fluid for that matter. But I also have another, my question is also about the very concept of the natural disaster, which is um, how did people in China during the period that you're working on count the disaster. Like my question is like, for example, there could be a rain, a regular rain, heavy rain, and torrential rain and yep. flood right. like disaster. Right. So at what point at which point does the regular rain begin to be seen as a disaster? And mm -hmm. I think this kind of way of classifying the disaster is always very inherently artificial and yep. political. So I was just wondering if you have seen any kind of discourse going on. I think it has a lot to do with the kind of you know methodological issues like the equivalent of the modern science and the kind of scientific way of quote unquote measuring. Right. No, I, I think you're totally right. It was actually highly political and so on. So and um, so here for me is actually one question in terms of just directly, is that the whole concept of natural disaster was probably relatively new in China, right? As a separate category called natural disaster because the zilan in itself is a new, relatively new concept. As a, as so, so in a sense that, so if you go back though to in the history and so on, you, when you go to look at a gazetteer or when you look at the dynastic histories and so on, they were always listed, uh, you know, so, so on and so forth. So I think one way to think about that, when, when do they start to use certain phrases to describe a disaster, such as a flood, it can be many different things. If we, they use uh, certain things like lao and so on, so it means big, big uh, you know, flood and so on and so forth. And then that means uh, they begin to uh, see this as a major uh, disaster and so on and so forth. I, I do not think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that I do not think they have a very fixed category for disaster or not. It, the disaster itself is, uh, is not so much a qualitative thing than a quantitative thing. That is, a disaster means indicative of a certain kind of uh, changes, right? And these changes can be political, can be social uh, changes, and they can be, be impactful. Right, so and, the, and, and that would be, if it's a rise to a certain kind of situation that people consider it to be E, means aberrant or abnormal, means the cosmological order was a little bit out of whack. And that means it's indicative of something major. So I think that disaster means it's not simply a natural phenomenon people suffer, which obviously there is that, but then itself is also related to how the political order is going, uh, so on and so forth, so yeah. So 
So that's a good question. I think what I, I, I should do, excellent question, is go back to think how they actually, before they have this modern concept of natural disaster, how do they actually, uh, do they have different categories for different kind of disasters? And uh, what, what would be the criteria for the uh, put certain kind of things in certain kind of categories and so on? So. Oh, are you taking questions? Or I'm yeah, sorry. It's I'm okay. Just, yeah, yeah, I am, I'm going to take them, but, uh, but go ahead, and then we'll go to the next one. So just sort of raise your little hand, and I'll try and keep track. But yeah, please go ahead. I just had a quick question in terms of how you see the relationship between the administrative system and the local central relationship in disaster management. So like, with the example of the early response to the pandemic, the cover-up happening largely because of local officials not wanting to be liable for the pandemic. But then and later on, the implementation of lockdowns and restrictions happened because of the penetration of the administrative system down to the local level. So right. how do you see the tension between those two trade-offs? The advantage, not to talk about advantages and advantages, but how do you see the administrative state and the response and the relationship? I think there's a problem with, uh, here's the kind of a particular political structure of PRC often run into these issues. Mm -hmm that um, I study earthquakes during the Cultural Revolution era. And the, during that time, they are pushing for collective monitoring, collective uh, defense. That is, so in a sense that it, it also created difficulties for local, go, uh, local officials. That is, uh, do you, if you think based on whatever uh, you know, reports to you, if you think that there is a possibility of an earthquake, so now do you declare earthquake or not? If you declare there's an earthquake, but it doesn't happen, means that you put a production on, st stop the production, schools, whatever, it's all canceled, right? So society stopped, and it, uh, f and because you think there's going to be an earthquake, so and that's that's a lot of cost, right? And if you don't declare, and if it happened, you have the responsibility, right? So I think here comes to the tension is precisely this. Like it's that it's not clear like how for uh, local officials, like whatever you do, it's not always clear to you what the result would be. And your, your political future is depends on the goodwill of on top. So you don't know what you do is good in the eyes of people who are on top or not, and so on and so forth. On the other hand though, for people on top, there is one thing that sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes you want to have clear directions, but other times it's precisely useful for them to keep you uncertain. So I think that's the kind of tensions that cannot be resolved unless you have a very clear uh, structure. And uh, sometimes this ambiguity works. Sometimes this ambiguity could be unfortunate. Hi, uh, I'm Jason Chen, the Chief Lee at the Ministry of Commerce. <coughs> um, first of all, we thank you so much for, for the amazing talk and really insightful and thought provoking. Sort of a question on you know, how you see anthropogenic climate change might be a sort of precision and sort of situated within uh, the PRC's disaster governance. But, uh, let's say whether there will even be a people's war against climate change. Now, I'm asking this really because um, I'm sort of wondering whether there are any you know, triggers. Um, that could, you know, really consolidate, you know, the PRC's disaster response into somewhat like a, you know, campaign style people's war model that, that, you, you, that you theorize. Um, precisely because when I, you know, when we talk about, let's say, the COVID pandemic or you know, the out, first of all, the outbreak in Wuhan, and then later on, or when we're talking about the uh, earthquakes, whether it was really the nature of, you know, black swan, black swan events uh, that, that actually triggered. Uh, Know, campaign style, you know, people's war response. But rather, when we talk about, let's say, climate change, where it's not only a slow and accumulative by nature, but also in the sense that there's been a stronger sort of consensus on how human actions also contribute to you know, increasing risk and yeah. hazards of disasters, which ultimately is also tied to uh, political legitimacy, pretty much based on economic growth, which in other which otherwise would also increase. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so the hazard of climate change and the sort of extreme weather events. And so I'm so kind of curious how you know that could actually fit into you know. That's a perfect example of uh, thank you so much. Um, that's a perfect example of this pro problem with the war met uh, kind of people's war approach to disaster management. Climate change would be it because climate change is in part is um, 
um, or a disaster caused by climate change, uh, then in a sense is basically uh, uh, it's modern risk society and the normal accident. That is because precisely the slow disaster and the kind of a past process and the have sometimes it kind of a cause of these issues. And you say, oh, this is a, it's like almost as natural disaster, but it's actually about human actions collectively and then so on and so forth, right? So that's why I think people's war will have a hard time dealing with this kind of uh, uh, dis quote unquote disasters because it's not designed for this purpose. It's designed for externalized uh, enemies and externalized uh, uh, sh short sudden uh, kind of event. They can quickly mobilize people and uh, come back and they put things under control and so on and so forth. I think um, climate change, Anthropocene, and so on and so forth, it would require a different kind of framework. Uh, to, so I, I, I would not think that people's world would be very helpful uh, in this kind of regard and so on. So, but that's a good question. That, I mean, I would be surprised to see they have a people's war against climate change. That would be very hard to accomplish, it seems <coughs> to me. And it would not be, in my view, the most uh, helpful approach. So, yeah. Good question, though. I had to think about this. It's a people with climate change. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but on the other hand, it is, it is interesting to see how, say, PRC, conceptualize disasters. And that in itself, uh, it has advantages to some extent that is very highly controlled, command quick, and can mobilize people quickly. But on the other hand though, for certain kind of disaster, it simply doesn't fit in my view. So I don't know, yeah, I think about this issue, yeah. yeah. Richard? Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for this talk, Fatih. Uh, my question sparked from your response, uh, and by your response uh, to that earlier question, and it's this issue of, you know, how do you reward crisis averted, right? I mean, it's, it, I mean, rather than, uh, I mean, it's hard, you know, how do you quantify something that doesn't happen? Uh, and I was wondering whether you could uh, pinpoint either any examples in the period you study in China or in other, you know, comparative cases where this, uh, you know, people attempted to make sense of, or, you know, try to, Evaluate what kind of crisis was averted in uh, averted in that in that regard. So, for instance, whether you know people were saying it, historically uh, an earthquake that you know where, whereby the uh, you know epicenter at the epicenter of the Richter scale was X Y and Z, these many people died. But yeah. In this instance, we had that sort of uh, earthquake of such a magnitude, but we didn't see that much loss. For instance, were there like ways of quantifying? So a good response when they're uh, in, in, in that regard? Um, they did not have this exact formula. Um, but they, 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 every earthquake happened during that time, they will have a meeting to evaluate and to come to some kind of conclusion was it successful or not, so on and so forth. And so, uh, since their focus often is on, at that time, uh, prediction in the 1960s, the 70s, and the early 80s is a, a prediction. Often their f emphasis is on um, or highlight the examples that were successfully predicted, su successfully predicted, so to speak. So for example, Heisen earthquake, which became an uh, international sensation because they evacuated the uh, population um, basically the night before the earthquake, and then the earthquake happened. So it was supposed to be a success because uh, they evacuated people right before earthquake happened. Um, so, and that considered to be successful. But on the other hand though, and it became very complex. So they're kind of, a, they, they were very excited about it. They saw, oh, we're on the right track, and so on so forth. Then the ne next major earthquake was the Tangshan earthquake, which was officially not predicted. And then it was a disaster, a huge disaster. And then, so therefore, it's, you, you could see this kind of a tensions. And then, at that time, um, since the early 1970s, there were intense discussion about when to make, to declare, to, to say, um, to tell the city, uh, now it's time you should evacuate and so on and so forth. What kind of channels, who had the, who had the the political authority to make this decision is not precisely for the reasons that uh, earlier mentioned. Is that who should be responsible for making decisions of evacuation and all that so forth? So, so here's the kind of thing. So they have. I don't think they have a form, formula to say this is success or this is not success. But they they were a lot of time in the early twenties, uh, early seventies. They were already very concerned about uh, you know to 
about making the wrong decisions about earthquake prediction and so on. So, so and in part precisely because this political tension. So at that time it was very risky if you made a wrong decision and so on. So um, I, that doesn't really answer your question, but but they did not have a formula. That's uh, as exact formula how, how to uh, do that. But they there were a lot of concerns uh, about success and the failure. So how do how do you uh, say assign success or failures and so on and so forth. So. If I may have a quick follow up on that. So if that is the sort of uh, a measure by which they are gauging success, which is uh, you know the extent to which their predictions were accurate, were were there instances in this, the cases that you looked at where you have punishments visited out on people who evacuated and nothing happened? Yeah. And so originally. Um, there was, say, so Zhou like when in the early, uh, say, when it first happened in the 1960s, uh, uh, 66, the first major earthquake, Shanghai earthquake, and so on and so forth. And then the, the idea is that actually Zhou was uh, actually said that. It's like, you know, so, um, you know, feel free. I mean, not feel free, but feel, don't, don't constrain yourself, right? You, you should be bold, like, you know, uh, if you just make predictions if you think and so on and so forth. So, but very quickly, uh, in a, a few years, then it seems that that wouldn't work because they just let people uh, say, predict and say, oh, let's stop and you know let's evacuate. Then it caused too much social uh, cost. That's just like political, you know, it just it caused so much uh, social political problems. Like it's make everybody was nervous and so on and so forth. So then they begin to turn back and to say there are certain procedures you have to follow. And then so the only certain people can make uh, certain decisions and so on and so forth. So, so, so there were, uh, so in Sichuan, for example, there, was, um, there are two major earthquake zones. One is in North, North, uh, North China. The other one is in Central China, uh, Sichuan and the Sichuan during that time. And they, they were, uh, you know, because they were kind of, there was a, a prediction that there was a big earthquake going to happen in uh, Sichuan. And there's also a prediction in North China. But in any case that, so, the, the local officials kind of uh, closed down some of these uh, production uh, kind of units many times, and it caused so much problem. And then um, the basically they got punished. Yeah. So if I can interject very quickly, and then we'll get to your question. This conversation hits home rather, Fatih. I thought you would go in that direction. Fatih was supposed to present a few weeks ago. Uh, but then we were supposed to get 14 inches of snow, as you might recall. <laughs> so we, uh, we had to cancel the talk or postpone it, rather, right? And so it begs the question of, there are, there are sort of more, I guess, smaller scale instances of what you're discussing where the stakes aren't as high, but plans get changed. Uh, and Victor wouldn't be here to ask this question if we'd done it two weeks ago, right? Because he was yeah, not sure. in the country. Yeah. So, so there are interesting ways in which I think this plays out, um, uh, in, even in sort of much much smaller stakes, when much smaller stakes are involved in some ways. I was going to ask a question, but I saw another hand up, so I'm, I'm going to defer to our, our guest. Yeah. I have a question. I'm a division student at Harvard College from China. So um, you talked a lot about like how political structure can shape the disaster governance. Do you see any um, example of reverse causality? Like, uh, could the disaster governance somehow reshape the structure of distribution of the um, that's an excellent question. So here's would be I say, Sun Tan Zhi Jiu. It was a very important principle uh, in later disaster governance. Sun Tan Zhi Jiu itself is a product of a particular condition. It's a, a came out of the Yan'an era precisely because it's so material deprived situation. So that's 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 in itself. The policy itself was be, uh, kind of a came out from the particular local uh, situation, a particular time and the place, uh, and it was folded into the people's war. And then that actually continued for a while. Right? As you can see throughout the 1960s, and I show you the pictures and so on, it's all of emphasis on both Zizhou as disaster preparedness. And that in itself is a product of a good time and society and so on and so forth. And so, so in a sense that um, maybe, here's a, for people to think about, and so maybe if this doctrine um, in terms of the COVID pandemic, maybe it arguably was not the necessarily the best doctrine uh, to, to deal with in this kind of situation, but it had a long history, right? So and it came out, and that's precisely in, uh, kind of a condition, social, political, ecological conditions that shaped the particular ideas.
great. Maybe we have time for one or two final questions before we can, yeah, the microphone's still closed. Yeah, and then, well, maybe you can take both of them together then, so. Is that okay, Fatih? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I can't see. That's the power. One on this side and then one on this side. So, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I was actually wondering how you would potentially like position the factor of ideology in disaster governance in the Chinese history. Because in my understanding, I think the war approach is a very active choice in a specific ideological context. Um, in other words, I think it's a, a war approach is a reflection of the ideology of PRC. Um, and uh, I, it also came to my mind of how there were waves of discussions in, during the first period of the, the pandemic um, in 2020. There, was a, there were discussions over how uh, the outbreak of pandemic of COVID-19 is resentful. It uh, resembles the Chernobyl incident in Soviet Union, which is uh, in which the failures and uh, uh, chaos and mass in management uh, were reflected in their management, which is contingent on their pre-existing pre political and ideological structures. So I'm just wondering, like, how you position the ideological factor in your study. So, Fatih, hang on. Take, take the other question too, and then <laughs> we can take them together. So, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm also wondering about the sustainability of the concept or the strategy of people's war. Because I remember in China, for example, people think for the first two years of COVID, the kind of mass mobilization method is quite effective. But yeah. for the third year, there was mass protest and discontent. Yeah. This. So, this war fatigue, I'm wondering about yeah. the consequences of deploying this kind of strategy. And my kind of second question is, last year actually Scott Moore came and gave a talk on a climate risk to China's rights. And he commented kind of the insurance co coverage in China is very kind of, there's a, like a failure mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. The insurance institution only covers 10% of China's natural disaster versus globally the average right. will be right. 30 percent to 40%. So I'm also wondering, what's your take on who bears the burden of the cost of natural disasters? Yeah, no, that story, that's, that's why I think that um, it, it's the, that's why I thought about risk production. And that's why I was, so uh, who is responsible for what? That's precisely this issue. And, uh, you know, so in the U.S. too, like, there was actually, not until the mid-20th 19th, uh, mid century, there was actually begin to have uh, good disaster insurance and so on. There's a federal government that got involved. And the, here, I think that the point, however, uh, is about the, 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 the uh, tendency to see natural disaster as kind of an emergency response, uh, you know, kind of war metaphor, would actually take, that's why I think that it's important for us to, remember the limitations of this war metaphor is precisely this, that is, uh, such as insurance and so on, this would be coming back to, to see risk, to see hazards, to see disasters as kind of normal process, mm -hmm. right, normal excellence. As a risk society, you must take this risk into the consideration. And so, so insurance policy would be part of this kind of understanding of how society should face this kind of disasters, right? So everybody should share responsibility in some ways, you have this cushion, and so on and so forth. But war metaphor, somehow I find it, like war, war structure, and somehow I feel that it kind of divert us from seeing these things. It's, it's really externalized these accidents or disasters as something we come back and defend us against. Rather see it's just part of a parcel of our society. And which is not to say that you should not reduce risk, but which is to say that risk are probably not going to be easily eliminated. And so therefore it should be shared uh, responsibility, right? And here comes to, I think, you, you, what you talked about war fatigue is definitely the problem of this war, war approach, the first war approach. It's, you can mobilize very fast, you can, um, it, it could be very effective in the first uh, period, first phase of war, but with, any war, like once you drag on and on and on, it becomes much more difficult. It becomes a war of attrition. It's very hard to fight war of attrition. I mean, just imagine that World War I, uh, people first said the war will be over in three months, and everybody signed up to fight, and then it's trench warfare. 
and that is different, mm -hmm. right? So, and sorry, you, I, do not, I cannot kind of precisely, you talk about ideology, but I wanted to uh, ask precisely like what exactly you, you mean by that, and uh, your question is. Yeah, my question was just mainly about how you position ideology or the factor of ideology in your study of disaster governance in the Chinese history, um, more specifically in um, PRC. Mm -hmm. um, because in, as I said, I, I, in my understanding, I think uh, the war approach is a reflection of its ideology and um, the, also the discussions during the pandemic over like the similarities between the outbreak of yeah. COVID-19 mm -hmm. and the Chernobyl in incident, um, which in which uh, the chaos and uh, mass uh, and uh, failure of response um, both showed in both ac accidents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah, which okay. are both contingent, contingent on your pre-existing pre right. political and ideological. Okay. Structures. Right. So here's, um, in terms of ideology, it depends on how we define ideology. But I would say the people's war itself is both an ideology and a model. So, so let's say the ideology means that it's a political belief, uh, and that can be traced back to the Yaman period and so on and so forth. A model means it's a particular structure of uh, approaches and the framework of uh, dealing with disasters. So it's, it's, you cannot separate ideology from uh, actual uh, model in this case. And so, do I feel that, I mean, for me, I would say that I feel that maybe that's not a necessarily a good model for many disasters. And that's why I say, and it's both ideologically as well as a model, I think it has limitations. Uh, as to compared to uh, Chernobyl, um, yes, I think there are certain kind of situations because actually people talk about Chernobyl and so on. People find a lot of uh, um, human uh, factors built into the disasters and so on and so forth. And here comes to what uh, Charles Perrault called about normal, normal uh, accidents. That is, uh, for a larger complex technological system or as a larger uh, society and so on and so forth, they, it, it, both the technological system, both the material inf uh, mat materiality of these structures, but also human um, errors and so on, are all intertwined together is bound to happen. That is that. So you cannot eliminate them. It's not possible. And you just have to, in a sense, live with it and deal with it, find ways to reduce the uh, disaster and so on. So in this case, it's, uh, it's, yes, I agree with you. And I would say ideologically, it's not um, equipped necessary to deal with certain kind of disasters effectively, um, which in the case, uh, I would say, uh, like the, the people's wars model. Great, thank you. So we are at 5.30, so I think we should bring uh, proceedings to a close. So uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you so much for a great Thank talk. you so much. Uh, this was very helpful. Thank you.